my understanding was it was from 1956 onwards. So then you sit down and you try to work out who might who might be be categorised as not just another All Black, not just a very good All Black, but a superior All Black, a, a, therefore a great All Black. And some names pick themselves. Meads, for example, McCaw, uh, uh, Don Clark, I'd suggest, Michael Jones. And then there are others who you might think was worthy of being a great, but some of the other, rest of the panel would not. So you then have to go through the voting process and come up with a 20 like that. He enjoyed a fairly free reign at the start of his career. There was um, the noise around sort of Carlos v Mertz was actually relatively advanced in, in his career and you know you had your favourites. Personally, you know if I was paying to watch rugby I, I dispense with the sort of people I paid to watch. But if I was an all-black selector I probably would have picked Mertens. It was that strange sort of um, dilemma that you, you sort of faced every time you became involved in a, a debate. Carlos Reed Mertz. I mean, he's an outstanding goal carrier and he kept long. He, he wasn't afraid to have a go from around the sort of halfway mark. I can't remember many tests where his goal kicking let us down. And I can remember several where it proved the difference between us winning and losing. In some respects, he was lucky to play in the, on the sort of cusp of that era where the All Blacks decided it was very, it was okay to run from deep. Foxy was a, a brilliant first five, um, and he played to a very sort of rigid structure, which was you worked for territory. Once you're in sort of attacking zones, that's when you freed up your outsides, and he was a master of that. Mertens was a little bit more laissez-faire. If he saw the sort of space for his outsides in his own 22, he would have no hesitation of shoveling the ball on. So he's a little fortunate in that respect that it was acceptable for all blokes to play rugby like that um, when he came on the scene. But you know, having said that, you've still got to have the gift of being able to see where those opportunities exist, and he did that magnificently. A little unfair to sort of call him the glue of the back line because that sort of uh, it almost makes it sound as if he was a slightly sort of stodgy, formulaic player. He was anything but. He was a, you know, he was a gifted athlete in his own right. But, you know, his, as you say, his great gift was freeing those that had more explosive pace and power outside him and letting them do their stuff. The man had a bit of an aura about him. Physically a very imposing figure. He was an outstanding loose forward. Made his test debut in 1959 against the Lions. And he was part of a terrific all-black forward pack through the 1960s. But it was, it was that era of Meads, Winneray, Nathan, with whom he, uh, he formed a pretty dynamic loose forward partnership. And he worked this arrangement with Nathan, where uh, Nathan was very quick off one side of the scrum. Tremaine was pretty, pretty quick for a big man as well. Complimented each other very well. And in fact, Walker Nathan, when I spoke to him about Tremaine, uh, he, he spoke glowingly of him, of, of his work uh, on the field as a, as a footballer and his selflessness uh, and the, uh, what he contributed to the All Black teams through his time. It was a terrific time for New Zealand rugby and he was very much at the forefront of it all. He had a very brief turn as captain in 1968 against France, his last series. His try scoring record was remarkable, for, certainly for its time. In fact, you could probably argue that he was a little bit of ahead of his time in, in much of what he did. He scored nine tries in 38 tests, which then was a lot for a loose forward. 
but if you look at his first class record, he scored 136 tries in 268 games, which is a remarkable achievement. One thing that Colin Mead said about him was that 10 yards out from the opposition line, there was no player in the world who was harder to stop than Tremaine, which is pretty high praise from, from Pine Tree himself. And of course, they were great mates. He and, he and Meads were, uh, were terrific friends, going back to their very earliest days together, playing for the All Blacks. He was a dynamic player, another large back, broke tackles from the wing, could offload, extraordinary passes out of the tackle, uh, hit people with a brutal force uh, in defence. He started off in the 90s and, and was picked on some superb, super rugby form. He was the power in the back line so that when the skilled men like Cullen and, and Wilson perhaps had had, had a shot with, with their trick bag, uh, if that wasn't working they'd go to Tana and he'd bust some doors down for a while so that these guys' skills could operate. So he would, he would cart the ball up, he would create some openings, some gaps, but he would certainly lead the defensive line. That was, he was very strong in that. He was also brutal on his teammates who didn't do that part of the job. I mean, rugby was 50% attack, 50% defence, and if you missed part of that, Umanga certainly let you know. He was a do-as-I-do type of leader. I think Polynesian players especially uh, were brought more into the fold and said, crikey, if, if Tana can play like this all the time, so can we. He set some standards for the others to follow. Not only a very world-class centre. He played 70-odd tests, I think, for, for the All Blacks. Became the first Polynesian captain uh, of New Zealand. He was a terrific player, and it had to be a game that he loved because he was still playing this year, wasn't it? I feel looking back on him that there was a touch of genius about much of what he did on the rugby field. He had a strong individual streak in him, close to the line, off the back of rucks, uh, scrums. He was a very hard man to stop, low trajectory when he was running close to the line. Good pass, uh, it could be a little bit erratic, but when it was on song he, was, he, had, a, he had a good pass. But I. I just think looking back on him now, he was one of those guys who had a bit of an X factor about him. He didn't quite know what he'd do. Sometimes his teammates probably didn't quite know what he was going to do, but he certainly had terrific natural ability. He came in in 1967 on the tour to Britain and France as understudy to Chris Laidlaw, played one test on that, and the two of them dueled over the halfback job for the next three years up until the tour to South Africa. When Laidlaw was injured in the first test, going came on and they split the, split the appearances on that tour. 1971, Laidlaw was gone, going took over, and he basically had the job to himself until 1977. His career came to um, an unfortunate end in 1977. He played the first two tests against the Lions. The second test at Christchurch was lost 13-9, and the selectors decided it was time for some changes. Two of those who went were Colin Farrell, the, the ill-starred fullback from Auckland, who played the first two, and that was his lot, and Sid Going. And that was the end of, uh, that was the end of Super Sid's All Black career. But he was certainly an outstanding halfback uh, and a very gifted footballer.
Shepherd was the man. And him and Graham Murray were the man when you were growing up in Taranaki in the 70s. A quality halfback, uh, very good reader of the game, very good passer, very good kicker. His crowning moment was undoubtedly the Lions series of 83 and the dreadful weather test um, at Athletic Park. And he, I mean, it's now known as Trapper's Test, and he just ran that game. The way he marshaled the forwards around, the way he uh, ran with the ball and you know, culminated in a um, very good individual try and a, and a performance which probably hasn't been better by a New Zealand halfback. His role in 78 on that Grand Sam Tour he was going as backup to Donaldson. I don't think there was much doubt about that. And then Donaldson was injured before the Wales Test. He even captained the All Blacks in the Bilzo Cup. A really nice bloke too. I mean, uh, the nickname Trapper, which he's worn with pride since his very early days as a, a Taranaki uh, player as a kid. He was, um, he was given the name by Ash Gardner. He called him a rat trapper. Yeah. <laughs> the rat was dropped and he became Trapper and he's won it as a badge of honour ever since really. Like a lot of players, his career kind of faded out to a little bit of a whimper really where when a knee injury left him just a couple of paces behind. I think his final test was in Buenos Aires against Argentina. It wasn't a great test. Um, and he, even in those amateur days, he enjoyed his final year of rugby was for the Harlequins Club in London.